Women Taking the Lead, Episode 157. Trust. Based on everything we've talked about, I used to have this belief that the most important thing was getting it right. I just want to do it right. I don't want to waste time. I just want to get it right. And I think that that as I've gotten older and a little bit wiser um, and a little bit more humble, I've just realized right is an illusion. There's only what there is, you know? And if I could have just trusted that life was going to be exactly what it was and learn to release some of that control, I think my journey would have been a lot more peaceful. And I try and remind myself of that every day. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. Head over to womentakingthelead.com to join the community and get the resources to support you on your leadership journey. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Caroline Green, who is a recovering lawyer, chronic overachiever, and two-time Amazon best-selling author of Matter, How to Find Meaningful Work That's Right for You and Your Family, and Next, How to Start a Successful Business That's Right for You and Your Family. As a life and business coach, Caroline helps determined moms build businesses and whole lives that truly matter to them. Caroline, it's such an honor to have you here. So that's just a little overview of you and what you have going on. So tell us a little bit more about you and your humble beginnings. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'd love to share a little bit more about my story. So um, I actually grew up moving all the time as a kid. I call myself an urban gypsy, um, which actually came from a collage I did for a third grade project, you know, like tell us about you. And it was on the cover of the New York Times that week. And um, it's stuck ever since because I moved about every three years and um, really found myself starting over again. And no matter where I went or what I did, um, my parents always emphasized traditional success. Get good grades, be kind, um, do the best you can, and um, and and always, always, always put a huge, huge emphasis um, on education. And so um, most of my young life was focused on doing the best I could in school um, and really geared towards I ended up going, going away to a private boarding school, um, which was one of the top schools in the country. And then I went straight into, um, to college and then straight from college into, into law school and straight from law school to the best job that I could get really focused, um, in these roots of just moving forward and focusing on that, on that one sort of conventional understanding of, of what success looked like. Um, and so my whole first half of my life was that way. It was highly driven, highly motivated. Um, I tell a story in my first book, Matter, um, that uh, my brother used to wear the shirt that, that said, go hard or go home. And it, on some level, I sort of internalized that as my my personal mantra for the first half of my life. Um, and and then and then I had children. And, um, you know, I think for anyone who's on any kind of journey, there's always some sort of catalyst, whether it's um, a loss or a change or a relationship shift, whatever it might be. And for me, it was really, um, at first having children and then struggling with postpartum depression with my second child that really sort of caused me to step back and ask myself, is this type of success, is this road that I'm on really taking me where I want to be both as a human being, um, but also as a mother. And, and that was sort of, um, what opened me up to this new way of living and loving in the second half of my life. Oh, what a great story. And I can completely identify because one of my mantras is work hard, play hard, mm, <laughs> right? yeah. you know, which works in certain areas of my life and actually, you know, worked for me for a long time. But now I have to, you know, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. And sometimes I have to think about other things too. And mm. it's so interesting how, you know, something like motherhood, like had you stop. And really think about the focus with which you were going after everything and realizing you needed to take a bigger picture of everything that was going on. And it really sounds like it opened up this whole new level to your life. 
Yeah, you know, it really did. And um, I don't want to disrupt your interview flow, but one of the questions that you asked that I was really thinking about was your aha moment. Mm -hmm. You know, when is it that you really shifted? And for me, that that moment came um, with in the middle, right after the sort of my postpartum cloud started lifting. So with my second child, I actually had um, what they're now calling early onset pregnancy depression, I think. Um, I am clearly not a medical professional, so don't take my word for it. But um, I, I had that hormone shift and that sort of, I call it the deep darkness. The deep darkness settled over me when I was pregnant with my second child and um, lasted all the way through until she was about nine months old and sleeping through the night. And um, and she just started sleeping, which I always say to any new mom out there, you know, especially if you're someone who who's prone to pushing yourself so hard, we want to get right back Back to it, you know, we're, we're uh, especially for my generation, I'm um, in my mid thirties now is like that. Um, you know, we're not going to be slowed down by anything and we can do anything and we're just going to go right back to it. But we don't hold space for the fact that when we're, we're not sleeping, like we can barely see straight, you know, mm-hmm. there's a reason that if you um, don't sleep, you'll test, you basically are as incapacitated as if you were dr- driving yes. um, under the influence, right? It's like, this is, it's like alcohol. It's really, it's really has this huge effect on it. So, um, I really wasn't, I couldn't even actually understand or see that I was having such a hard time until I started sleeping. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I really did. I had this moment as cliched as it sounds where I was getting out of the shower one day and I caught my own reflection in the mirror. And, um, and I looked at this person and, um, and she was, her eyes were like so gray and she looked dull and, um, and sad, you know, she really looked sad, this person I was looking at in the mirror. And I, and I just had this sudden realization that on the inside, you know, I was a confident, happy, outgoing, um, sort of like lust for life type person, you know, and, um, but I was showing up in the world as this exhausted, um, frustrated, resentful, sad person. And in that moment, I realized I experienced for the first time that huge, gap between who I understood myself to be on a very deep level and who I was showing up in the world as on a daily basis. And I walked out from, from the bathroom. I was still in my towel. My poor husband was um, just putting on his pants. He was just like trying to go to work, you know? And I looked at him and I said, I said to him, um, I said, I don't know if I can be happy. Like other people can be happy, but I'm going to try for you and for the girls Um, and for myself, I'm going to try. And I really did marry a saint. He's one of my many gifts from God is my husband. And he just looked at me and and he said, okay, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like one word, one word more might send me off the cliff. So he he just like nodded and I nodded and I said, okay. And I like went and got dressed. And that was, that was the moment where, um, I really just started shifting to, there's got to be something more, not more money, more success, more achievement. I'd done those things, but more, more joy, more laughter, more presence more something um, than I was on the road towards at that point. Yeah, it wasn't all about achievement anymore. Yeah, that's Oh my gosh. Sorry, Carolyn, but I'm I'm cracking up laughing because your husband's response <laughs> yeah, was perfect. Was perfect. Yeah. Right? I know. In that Terrible. moment you didn't need any anything else. All you needed to know was that he heard you exactly. and he was on board. That was it. That's all you, if he had said anything more, I, I think it would have interrupted what you had going on in, in internally. And so it just allowed you to then be like, okay, I'm going to move on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Glennon Melton, um, I won't get the quote right, but often says that, um, that we, what we, we, when we need, that we need love, right? And that presence is the purest form of love. Just acknowledging being deeply heard and deeply listened to, um, is in fact the purest form of love that we can express for another human being. And, um, I of course didn't know that then. I quite frankly was not in a place where I could think about things like that so deeply, right? Like I was just trying to get dressed in the morning. But, um, but I think back on that moment and that's exactly, you know, how well he loved me and that simple. Okay. I love that. I love that. And what did you do next? Was, were there any like strategic or tactical steps that you took that allowed you to experience more joy and happiness? Yeah. So the first thing I did was look for a good therapist, which I have to say, I didn't really find, it took me a long time to find someone that, that could really help me. And for me, coaching actually was much more helpful than, 
um, than therapy. And they're both so important. Um, I think they're, they're both tools on our journey. Sometimes we'll need, um, different types of support from different people. But for me, um, you know, I started, I started looking for a therapist. I started really asking very simple questions. So I, um, I had converted to the Christian faith when I was in graduate school actually, and sort of had gone in hook, line and sinker, but hadn't really stepped back to use the same level of critical thinking about what is it that I really believe? What is it that I really want for myself? Um, that, that I was beginning to employ in other areas. And so I really started just asking those hard questions of my faith, of my family, of my personal life, of my work. Like, what was it that I actually wanted now that I wasn't chasing the gold medal anymore? Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was sort of, not that I achieved a gold medal, but the Olympics are on as we're recording this. And, um, (laughs) And I do, I sort of like, I, it's my after the podium moment, you know, cause in my own way, like I had reached the goals that I wanted. It wasn't an Olympic medal, but I had a job that I loved. I had a family I loved. I had a house that I loved, you know, all of the sorts of just markers that I had set up for myself. I had, I had reached and yet I still felt so dissatisfied. So, um, and it, I felt so much guilt about feeling dissatisfied. Um, and a lot of shame because I knew that there were so many people in the world whose, whose goal list actually had on it things that I had. Right. And, it, and I still didn't, I still felt empty. I still felt unfulfilled. And that made me feel awful, it made me feel really selfish, made me feel really guilty. And so, um, so my journey wasn't so much strategic as it was surrender. It was really just saying, I can't, I can't, Um, keep feeling guilty and shameful about feelings that I'm having. Like this is just where I am. And um, coaching helped tremendously with that. Um, I didn't actually ever intend to be a life coach. I, um, you know, this is my left brain thinking I sat down and figured out how much it would cost to get trained as a life coach versus continue with therapy. And that um, if I just got trained and helped myself, then I wouldn't need, (laughs) need somebody else to help me, which is of course not true. Right? Like I of course went through life coach training and continued to need support and help. But that was the thought pattern. Never thought that I was going to become a life coach. Um, and yet the tools that I learned and the way of thinking, you know, we were just talking about love as being deeply seen and deeply heard through coaching. I felt like there was a community of women in the world who were actually asking the same questions. And, um, you know, one thing that happens is we get so isolated in our own communities, so isolated, especially if you've got kids and you're just in that bubble of getting them dressed and getting them to school and getting them out the door and getting food on the table and of only surrounding yourself with people who are really just trying to keep their heads above water. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But when you're starting to not just try and keep your head above water, but really trying to swim and surf and explore the ocean, um, you need that breath of fresh air that comes from other people who are asking the same questions you are. So just going through, um, through coach training was a huge part of that journey that really helped me start asking myself these questions on a much deeper level. Mm, What a great process to be a part of. And, and I love how you put it, the goals that you had achieved, they were your goals, you know, but partly they were shaped by, you know, what you knew to be things that made you successful, you know, so they were worthy goals, but you'd achieved them but I think there was some disillusionment that that happened where there's almost this expectation we have that when we achieve certain goals, that we will then be happy. And when you get there, it's so disappointing. Yeah, you know, and this is true in everything. It's true in um, we I think the most common way that we hear about it, like through Facebook and social media is the weight loss journey. Like I thought I'd be happy when I lost weight and then I wasn't and then I just gained weight again. But it's actually true for every area of our life. And the other thing that you really put your thumb on in your observation is that there are really two things going on. So one is when you own your own goals, meet them and you're dissatisfied. The other is when you think you've set goals that are yours mm-hmm. and you achieve them and you realize that they're others. They're your parents. They're the world. They're your culture, your community, your husband, your brothers, right? That you've just, you didn't have that space. And again, no judgment, but there just wasn't room in your life at that point to step back and say, um, I just, I don't want the gold medal because that's what good athletes do right? Like Mm -hmm. you, you win worlds and then you go to the Olympics. That's just the next thing. Right. And, um, so many of us just do the next right thing in quotes, um, and really stepping back and saying what's right for me. Those are, they're two different, they're two different aspects. And they're so, um, of course, 
deeply, deeply interwoven, but both can lead to feelings of deep satisfaction, even after huge objective success in our lives. Yeah. Okay. We've been talking about huge success for a little while. So now I'm going to take us back a step because I'm very curious about your playing small moment. You, you described yourself as being really focused and achievement oriented. Um, and it sounds like you went through the early part of your life really confident, but I wanted to level the playing field and, and we, we heard about your prepartum <laughs> depression, mm-hmm. which is like, wow, I'd never heard of that before. That's something interesting and good to know. But I'm interested in your playing small moment, the moment, you know, yeah. the moments we all have where because we don't realize how capable and smart and intelligent we are, we undervalue ourselves and we don't go after what we're fully capable of. We hold ourselves back. So if you could share with us that story and the lessons you've learned. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I think um, before I share it, I just want to say it really doesn't matter how much you've quote unquote achieved. And I can say this because I've been there um, that we all undervalue ourselves. And uh, the vast majority of my clients have graduate degrees from one of the best universities in the country. I have Ivy League graduates. I have Rhodes Scholars. I have all of these women. They're not exclusively my clientele, but I, I coach a number of them um, who've had in careers that would just knock anybody over. They're so impressive. Um, and, and they all, they all undervalue themselves. And, and what, what that really means is what we're holistically capable of as human beings, not just as cogs in a workforce or whatever it might be. Um, that we're not, we, we, we really undervalue our, the, the enormity of our human potential. So I just want to, to put that out there to start. But yeah, my playing small moment came, um, really after I had sort of taken this step back. Um, I had gone through the postpartum. I had started getting help. I had sort of thought about, um, what my journey would look like. And all of that took place when I was actually on an extended leave from my, um, from my law firm. And, um, I always thought that I would go back. I was struggling with this new call. I didn't know what, what to do. It was really hard to walk away from that. All of those hours and all of the money and time, um, and ego that I had invested in my legal career. And, um, but I, I finally made the decision to start, um, launching a coaching practice and I had been home for some time and that wasn't really a good fit for me. Um, and so, um, so I was ready to, to, to start my business. And, um, or at least take a, take a really good look at what was next for me outside of the legal profession. And when I did that, um, because of the sort of the story or the narrative or perspective of success that I had when I was staying home, I had taken on all of the home responsibilities. So I basically said to my husband, you're working now. I'm not. You go be the breadwinner and I'm going to be the chief operating officer of the house. I will do all things home. I'll manage the schedules. I'll manage the nanny. I'll do like all of the like logistics, pack the lunches, make sure there's food, take out the garbage, like all of the home stuff I had really owned. And what I didn't understand then was at the time, I just wanted to be loving and of service um, to my family and to my husband. But what I didn't realize was that I was actually hiding. I actually, without, without the, I, without the label of um, a profession or career, um, I, I didn't value myself. I couldn't find my own self-worth independent of things that I was doing or achieving in the world. So I just transferred that lens to my house and I started running my house like it was a job. So when I then look towards starting something new, I actually, and um, I, I had a lot of false starts, which I think is very typical for entrepreneurs, even though I didn't know it then and um, had a lot of shame around it. Um, and one of my false starts was that I thought that I wanted to go to seminary. And so I actually, I had been thinking about seminary for a long time in various contexts and um, decided to finally bite the bullet. And I, and I went to seminary and I was in my first class and I loved it. I just absolutely loved it. And I came home and I said, I was standing in the kitchen. I'll never forget this. And I said to my husband, um, oh my gosh, I love this class so much. I think I might want to go get a PhD in religious studies and spirituality and, um, and teach or pastoral counseling and teach in a seminary setting. 
And my husband said, that's amazing. You should do that. Um, remember I said he was a saint and, um, (laughs) total saint. And this is like, yeah, so total saint. And I said, um, I said, there's only one problem. We were living, we live in Washington, DC. We were living in Washington, DC at the time. Our girls were already in school, all of that. We owned our home. I said, there's only one problem. There are only three schools I'd want to do it at one in Chicago, one in Atlanta and one in New York. And he said, okay, we'll move. And I looked right at him and I couldn't explain why, but I was like really angry. I was really confused and I couldn't even have the conversation. I just walked away. Like he said the nicest thing ever, right? Like I'll support you no matter what unconditionally, like I'll leave my own job and move our entire family for you. Like the, the most amazing loving thing that a partner could ever say. And I totally froze deer in headlights, which is, um, as you can tell from the way that I talk, not like me. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, so I went in seclusion and I, I actually set up a session with my own coach and I was telling her the story and she was like, so what happened? And I just started crying and I said, he would move for me and I wouldn't move for me. Like, what I realized in that moment is that he was completely willing to uproot my children from the school that they loved, um, leave their friends, sell our home, have him change jobs. Like he was willing to sacrifice all of those things. And let's not kid ourselves. They are sacrifices, right? They're, they can be sacrifices made in love, but my family would, would have to be, would, would have to be willing to give things up for me to have this opportunity. And he was willing to do that. Um, and, and, And I was not, it was, I couldn't ask that of them. Now there are two ways to look at the story. One is I didn't want it enough. Right. But that's not the experience that I was having in the moment. In the moment I was completely convinced it is what I wanted. It's just that I didn't value myself enough to be willing to allow other people to love me in that way. Mm -hmm. And I totally shut down the possibility. That's so interesting because I've seen that behavior in myself and other people where we get mad when people are trying to go above and beyond to help us. And we, we get like mad to the point where we're like, stop helping me. Stop. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, because we feel like they're doing too much. We're not worth the sacrifice that they're willing to make. And we get uncomfortable with it. It's so fascinating. Yeah. And it's so common. Um, and all too often we do it without awareness, Mm -hmm. right? We jump to, you're not listening. You don't understand. Like we go to this defensive, aggressive posture and, and we just don't have the tools or haven't been taught or haven't practiced to actually see that discomfort as, oh, they're offering me something that I'm not willing or capable of offering myself in this moment. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. When you've given up on yourself before other people have given up and the conflict that creates, Oh, Caroline, I have chills. It's so good. So now I, what I'm interested in, because now you've, you've had all these experiences, you know, you, you had that gung ho type a, you know, experiences heading into your career. Then you had the pivots that happened, um, after you had your second child and you went into a depression and the internal journey that set you on. Um, and now having your own business, I'm curious through all of this, what your leadership style has developed into. So Caroline, how would you describe your leadership style? So the way that I lead and the way that I, um, that I hold space for my clients to lead is, um, through two, two core values of honesty and compassion. And, um, what I always say to people is, you know, business like marriage should be hard, but it shouldn't be that hard, Mm -hmm. right? Like if, if you're killing yourself, if you're just, you're exhausted, you're extended, every, you face resistance in every task, you're overwhelmed, you're, um, you, you know, you find yourself not wanting to go to work in the morning, not wanting to face that partner, right? Then when we're really, we're out of alignment, that there is a way to be completely honest with ourselves and with other people and stand in real integrity, whether it's with sales, with marketing, with finding new clients, with shaping our business, with understanding our ideal client, that's really, um, in alignment and in complete, um, in complete honesty and integrity with who we are and how we want to serve. And so, um, I always say that, um, I will always, I am relentlessly honest and deeply compassionate. So I will always tell you how I see it and be open to being wrong about it, right? That's part of the compassion piece. Um, but, but knowing that, um, 
that the way that I lead is really just holding space for you to be able to see who, how you're showing up and who you're really being in this moment and owning that in a deep way so that the change that comes forth in your professional and personal life is of you and not as a reflection of what you think I want for you. Um, which especially, you know, as a recovering, um, people pleaser. And a lot of my clients are, um, re- really fighting those desires to do what we think is expected of us. What we, what we think that, um, our coaches or our teachers or our mentors or our bosses want for us instead of consistently showing up and asking ourselves what we want for us. Um, you know, without honesty, without that, that deep integrity and practice of honesty and in, in a deep, deep, meaningful way is really, really, really hard. So, um, that's the honesty piece. The compassion piece is, you know, we are, um, we're so hard on ourselves. And the easiest way, um, to think about a practice of compassion or self-compassion is listening to the negative self-talk in your own head and asking yourself, would I ever talk to another human being that way? 98% of the time, the things that we say to ourselves, we would never in a million years say to a friend that we loved and respected mm-hmm. ever. <laughs> and so really learning to be honest about that, notice that, and then have compassion for ourselves, for our, for where we are and how we're showing up and then being able to, from a compassionate place, move yourself forward. So what I say is compassionate accountability is a huge part of the way that, that I coach and the way that I show up in the world, because all too often we just want another checklist. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Just put me in coach. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's easy to do and very important when you first start to just overcome the fear and get going, right? Sometimes we just need someone to say, like, just give me the 10 things I need to do to get my first 10 clients. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you move beyond that of starting to really ask yourself, um, how, how do I want to show up and how can I show up without somebody telling me what I need to do next takes an enormous, enormous dose of compassion, um, for yourself as you're learning and evolving and growing and making mistakes. Um, so that's how, that's how I lead. And I, how I, I love it. <laughs> I love it. No, I, I think they both go hand in hand because if you're going to be direct and honest with people, the compassion piece makes it something that they can receive. Um, and, and, and vice versa, you know, it's great to have a lot of compassion for people, but you know, it can't be a, they're there, you know, you, you know, everything's fine type of compassion. It's got to be, you will get beyond this and you know, are you ready to look at how, what got you here Yeah, and how to, how to move forward? So I love that. And Caroline, you talked before about having some false starts, you know, in entrepreneurship. And I think a lot of us, you know, who've had, who've been in business for at least a couple of years can relate to that experience. You think you're going to go one way and you have to pivot and go in different directions. But what I'm particularly curious about right now is the leadership or businesses challenges that you're currently facing. Could you tell us about one? Yeah. So I true part of, um, what of my sort of calling and entering this field, I feel like is to be an entrepreneur again, in total honesty and really just call, tell things how, how it is. So my, my first book next, how to start um, a successful business is right for you and your family is actually like a tell all of my first year and all the mistakes that I made. And what I've realized like, as I've continued to grow is those mistakes, just as you said, aren't limited to your first year. And if we're really open and honest with our ourselves as entrepreneurs, we're constantly refining. We're constantly refining, not just because we're learning how to do things better and serve more deeply and reach our people in a more meaningful way, but also because we grow and change and our interests grow and change and we're our own bosses. And by the way, for anyone listening, like you get to change your business just because you feel like it, like you really do, you know? Um, and I think that there's so much pressure once we find something that's quote unquote working to stick with it. So I am actually in a season right now where I have this enormous luxury of, um, I've been doing, um, business coaching and and getting, seeing really amazing results, um, in helping women launch businesses. That's really what I love, love do is help helping them get through that first year, which can be so hard and so lonely. And what I found is that I'm attracting more and more clients for whom, 
Um, business isn't just business for them. It's really about something deeper. Um, for a lot of them, it's about a connection with God, a connection with divine, and not necessarily in the Christian tradition um, that I experience it as, but in however they connect to something larger than themselves. And that this business journey is really even bigger than we had understood it when we first started working together. Um, and starting a business is always a journey of personal transformation. But um, what I'm really seeing is that starting a business is, is has been a, a whole life transformation. People are just experiencing enormous shifts. And so I'm exploring um, how I can still deliver the practical, important aspects that really help people move forward in their businesses, but also be transparent and honest that um, my ideal client is looking not just to sell a product or, you know, to make money on the side, by the which there's nothing wrong with that. Like that's amazing and terrific. And we're all called to do different things, but that my ideal client is really ready to sort of make a a, a larger, more holistic shift. Um, and that they understand that their business is a part of that journey for them. That's going to move them forward and give them the courage and confidence they need to really start, um, giving themselves space to transform in other ways. So that's where, that's where I'm headed. And I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but I'm super excited about it. Um, and I'm going to beta some new programs this fall to see what that looks like and how that feels both for established entrepreneurs who are looking to um, just deepen their business and really sort of they've got a successful business going but they it's almost it's taking that old success feel to it that we were talking about you know it's really achievement externally oriented I'm doing what the what, what I think I should be doing in the marketplace and not what feels right for me um, and and also for new entrepreneurs Okay. And and on the flip side of that, I don't know if this is like the, the going to be the same answer to a different question, because it sounds like you're really excited about the thing that is challenging you most (laughs) in your business. So what's one thing you're working on right now that you're really excited about? Yeah. So of all these different shifts, um, one of the, this last part that I mentioned, um, this idea of, of deepening, um, your business in connecting it with your faith, um, of really understanding where God is or, um, where, however you experience God and the divine, like what the universe, if you will, or what source or, um, is calling you to and a much deeper level, how to, lo- how to love more deeply, how to serve more deeply, how to sell in a more authentic way that's really reaching your people um, is I've been betaing this this year and it's really it's getting really tremendous results not just in terms of up leveling people's business but also in terms of the joy that they're experiencing every day so of all of these different shifts that program is the one I think right now I'm most excited about I love that and I can definitely re- you know it resonates with me and I think with a lot of my clients as well too because my business is definitely mission driven. You know, mm-hmm. it does have a higher purpose. I am trying to change the world. And I find a lot of my clients, even if on the surface, their business isn't what people would describe as mission driven, what they're trying to accomplish through their business is definitely mission driven. Um, yeah. For example, the an insurance agent um, who I work with, her mission is to create safe spaces. Mm. for people and and she leads with that and everything she does is around creating safe spaces for people and I get so fired up when I hear what people's personal mission is in their business Mm -hmm. I can see why this is something you're super excited about must be so much fun yeah. And I'm super excited to hear that you're holding space for that because I think that, um, you know, there's just a lot of business coaches out there who are doing great work. I mean, there's no, this isn't a criticism, but, um, that only take people so far, you know, that are really focused on the external aspects, which are important, you right. know, how to market, how to, um, find clients, um, how to make sales, what sales calls look like, how to build sales funnels, like all of that stuff's so important. I, I'm grateful for the coaches that have taught me how to do it and, and I, and all the classes I've taken to learn those skills. Um, but I'm sort of in this space now where like really looking for a mentor who's willing to say out loud, um, you know, that there there is a divine element. There is something more to this that's calling me forward and integrating um, faith components like prayer, like stillness, like silence, like reflection, you know, really that there's a difference between self-doubt and um, and listening you know, that the deep listening to what you might be called to next. Um, and so whenever I meet a coach who's holding space for that in any capacity, it's just, it's always really exciting to hear. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. (laughs) And Caroline, you're doing a lot right now. And I know our listeners are always curious about, you know, when they see someone who's really going for it and really making it and, and they start to look at their life and what's missing. Why aren't they there yet? You know, they're very curious, you know, and sometimes there can be this illusion that the person who's making it is doing it on their own because we don't, (laughs) we don't see the behind the scenes. And I know just from our chat before we started recording, Recording, you have Lindsay on your team yeah. who helps you do what you do. If you could describe for us the people you have around you that help you to increase your your bandwidth and be more visible in the world. Yeah, and not just more visible, more more joyful. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a really. Um, we talked a little bit before the call started about how important I think outsourcing is, mm-hmm. and um, and outsourcing in a way that's in integrity with you, right? So, like, really, like if you love to cook and you want to cook for your family, don't outsource cooking. Like, I hate cooking. I hate it. So, like, I use every meal prep um, <laughs> meal prep thing. Like, I, we've did, we do. There's a local one that delivers. Some are pre cooked. Some are ones I make in boxes. Sometimes I do HelloFresh. Like, it doesn't matter what the answer is, but really be owning up to the fact that um, I don't want to spend an hour at the end of the day every day cooking. It's not in service to my family. It's not in service to me. So I, um, I have, you know, even if they're not individuals, I have all sorts of ways that I outsource. I, um, I have a live in. Um, I do not have a live in nanny. That must be a like a. Um, a desire, right? A secret, a secret <laughs> desire we've just uncovered that I have a live nanny because I don't, but I do. I have, um, I have a full-time nanny, um, even though my kids are in school. And so, and I'm really open about this and people are always like, Oh, that's so indulgent. Like, don't you feel bad about that? And I was like, no, cause I'm not in this for the money. Like I didn't, I didn't go for this transformation so that like I could buy myself a bigger house or like get a yacht. Like I'm not interested in that. I'm in this so that, so that I can experience greater joy. My clients can experience greater joy. And and that I model an authenticity, like what it takes for me to live in that space. And so like, I'm in a season where I can proudly proclaim, I do not do my own laundry. And that is awesome. Like, that mm-hmm. is, like It's great. And I know like, um, it's hard. Like a lot of women are afraid to say that that's something they want or something that they would ever spend money on because we have all these ideas of what we should or shouldn't do or how we'll be judged. Or, you know, it's easy for me to say, because I have all that help. And I just have to say to anyone listening, like, just let it all go and do what's right for you. So yes. Yeah, so I have a nanny who also helps me at home. I have an assistant who helps me with all the technical aspects. Um, and that's something I just did recently because I'm a firm believer that you should know how to do what you outsource. So don't hire a specialist to do something for you unless you know how to do it first with few exceptions, right? Like you don't have to learn how to code to build your own website. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about like the ins and outs of your regular business, your calendar, your lead pages, your, you know, just whatever that it's um, running at Facebook ads, like whatever the sort of the daily ins and outs, um, it's really important to understand what it is you're doing before you hire someone to do it. But added Lindsay to my team. So excited about that. Um, I've also found, I have a client, um, um, who started a, a home management um, business and she does hourly personal assistant packages. So you can sort of buy a set of hours throughout the year. So you don't, it's not someone on salary. It's not a huge investment, but um, I've got her and I can book time for her to help me, whatever it is, declutter my house, take things to goodwill, get that lamp fixed. That's been sitting in the basement for five years, you know, help me, um, the, the sort of one off random things. I use that. So I use a real, like my team is um, a really integrated team of help at home and help on the personal side of things, as well as um, help at work and help in business. Um, I've also recently partnered with interview connections who helped connect us. It's um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, helps pitch podcasts helps in, in that sense. So really helps me get my, I, I'm no longer doing all of the, the asks myself and all the pitches myself, which saves a ton of time and is um, really been a great thing for me. So I could go on and on and on. I mean, I really am. I'm constantly looking at um, balancing what's a good investment um, and not overspending because I do believe in keeping your overhead low, but also um, in making investments that uh, are going to lead not just to a higher return in terms of more clients and more booked revenue, but also just a higher joy quotient. Like, how are you going to feel in your business? Because if we, if we focus on that feeling state and we remember why we're in this in the first place, we'll attract the people who are meant to work with us. I deeply believe that. 
Awesome. All right. Now we're going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us in one sentence, what is one practice you have that helps to make you a better leader? Um, I'm a Martha Beck trained coach. And the way we say this is live it to give it is her little quip for this um, practice. But the way that what that looks like in my everyday life is um, I regularly work the steps in my own books. I sit down with my books and I ask myself, am I standing in integrity with the things that I'm asking clients to do and I'm asking readers to do through the books? And I wish I could tell you that like every time it's like, of course I am, you know, <laughs> like no problem. I've been doing this forever. But the truth is, is that um, I have to constantly do those integrity checks because it's very easy to get pulled outside of ourselves. So um, in one sentence, I, um, I live in practice what I teach and expect from the people who choose to work with me. And what is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? So this, I always recommend Steering by Starlight by Dr. Martha Beck. Um, it is not a leadership book per se, um, but it, it is a book that helps you really with very practical tools and deep insight answer these tough questions. What do I want? Right. Like, what do I want and what's the difference between um, what what I think I want and what I really want or what my parents expect of me and what I want for myself? Like those lines and we're first starting our journeys um, are very confusing and very cloudy. And um, this is just a really practical, straightforward book um, written with a lot of humor and um, a lot of wit to help people navigate those boundaries. And Caroline, what advice would you give your younger self? Trust. <laughs> You know, trust you, um, not trust that, you know, I think that, again, based on everything we've talked about, I used to have this belief that the most important thing was getting it right. You know, I just want to make the right choice. I just want to do it right. I don't want to waste time. I just want to get it right. And I think that um, the, that as I've gotten older and a little bit wiser um, and a little bit more humble, I've just realized right is an illusion. There's only what there is. You know, and if I could have just trusted that life was going to be exactly what it was and learn to release some of that control, I think my journey would have been a lot more peaceful. And I try and remind myself of that every day. <laughs> I often find with the, with this question, the answer still applies. <laughs> Oh, of course it does. Of course it does. It's not just when you're young. You still, mm -hmm. you still need to take this advice. That's awesome. And Caroline, share with us a success quote or a mantra that you have and why it has meaning for you. Yeah. So, um, my most meaningful quote is by, um, a theologian named GK Chesterton. And he said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. And when I read that for the first time, I was at a point in my journey where I, I, I literally could not understand those words. Like I read them and I was like, no, anything worth doing is something you can win. Right. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the mentality I had. It was like, you don't waste your time on things you do badly. Like that's just, you know, and I really fell into this trap where I remember like in college, for example, um, I dropped out of my first bio class, not asking myself, do I like biology? Would I, do I want to learn this information? But, but looking around saying, I'm never going to be smarter than these kids and I'm never going to get into med school competing against them. So I'm going to go do something else. Like I really, mm -hmm. it's embarrassing. You know, I'm sure my mother would cringe if she listens to this podcast and say, that's not how I raised you, but it's the truth, right? We do this all the time. We assess, um, where can we win? Where can we be the best? What, what, what tactic is going to make us most likely to quote succeed. And this beautiful mantra just reminds me in a deep, powerful way. Um, no, our calls often manifest themselves in the things that are the scariest and the most uncomfortable and the most new, um, so yeah, if it's not worth doing badly, then it's not worth doing. Mm -hmm. I love it. And Caroline, lastly, what is the best way for this community to connect with you? 
Um, so I'm online. I think like everyone else, at, um, my you can be reached at Caroline Green with an e coaching dot com. Um, and if any of your listeners would like a copy um, of Next, How to Build a Successful Business That's Right for You and Your Family, they can just email me at Caroline at Caroline Green Coaching dot com. Put Next in the in the um, subject line. Let that let me know where they heard about me, um, and my assistant will shoot them off a paperback copy of the book. I love it. And for those of you listening, you know you can find all the links and resources that Caroline has shared in this episode at womentakingthelead.com. If you put Caroline in the search tab, her show notes page or the blog accompanying this episode will come right up and you'll find all the places where you can reach her and get her email address. And Caroline, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here today. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Are you ready to take the lead in your own life but need some support? Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash contact to introduce yourself. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining with me and here's to your success.